Welcome back to Dielectric Videos. We're going to do three mini videos today consecutively. The first is going to be covering an interesting phenomenon in automotive taillight bulbs that actually allows you to demonstrate thermionic emission and even use one of these taillight bulbs as a high voltage rectifier in low current application circuits. Then I'm going to show you a project that I built a few years ago, which is a selenium rectifier based cell phone charger. And then I'll follow up with a final video where I'll cover a, an alkaline non-rechargeable battery that I found outside that I'm going to attempt to recharge and bring back to life. Let's start off by introducing a little bit of theory on thermionic emission. This is the principle by which vacuum tubes operate, and it's the principle by which specifically a vacuum diode operates. So when you have a plate and a, let's say, cathode, but in this case, let's just say two pieces of metal in a vacuum tube, when the both sides of this system are cold, the vacuum acts as a very excellent insulator. The electrons are confined to the cathode, they don't jump across the boundary to the anode, and in either a positive or negative electric field, no current flows. If you heat up that cathode, though, by, say, passing a current through it and causing it to heat up like a filament in a light bulb would do, the electrons begin to start boiling off of the surface of that cathode. Uh, they actually fly into the vacuum. However, since the electrodes, that, the electrons that leave the cathode cause the cathode to then become slightly positively charged, they're immediately drawn back towards the cathode because they happen to be negatively charged. This creates an equilibrium condition where, again, no current can flow to the anode. In this case, this is a blocking configuration or a close or an open circuited diode. Under the special condition, however, that a positive electric field is present within that vacuum, where the hot cathode is negatively charged by an applied voltage and the anode is positively charged relative to the cathode, all of those electrons that boil off the surface of that cathode due to thermal uh, thermionic emission will then be shuttled across the vacuum under the electric field that's present and attracted to the anode. This gives rise to the flow of an electric current. It stands to reason then that when a negative uh, potential is applied to the vacuum tube, no electrons will flow. This will behave as a diode in the off state. And when a positive electric field is applied, the electrons will flow and it will behave as a diode in the uh, conducting state or on state. What I have here is a standard automotive tail light. This is a Sylvania 4157 ultra white, ultra bright light. Now this bulb is unique in that it contains two separate filaments that are electrically isolated. One is for the brake light and one is for the standard tail light. This presents a unique opportunity in that these two separated electrodes are exist, they exist in this particular type of bulb in a vacuum, which makes it possible to perform thermionic emission and use this bulb as a rectifier diode, which I will show shortly. Now I actually was planning on demonstrating this using a similar Sylvania light that was a long life bulb, but I actually couldn't replicate the conditions and make it work. I suspect this is because this bulb likely has a, an inert gas atmosphere in it to attempt to increase the longevity of the filaments by reducing the boil off of tungsten over time. So this type of bulb actually won't work for this experiment. I've designed this circuit to test the phenomenon that I've talked about and I've actually built it in practice. So what I've done is I've wired a variable voltage DC power supply to one of the filaments of the light bulb. I'm using the brake light filament because it achieves a higher temperature than the tail light filament. I've connected one side of this, this is the filament side with the brake light, to 240 volts AC coming in via this plug. The other side of the 240 volt AC is routed through a power resistor, in this case 4.7k ohms, and then to the unlit side of the light bulb, which is the regular tail light filament. This will serve as the anode. I've connected an oscilloscope across the resistor in order to observe when voltage is present across the resistor, and thus when current is flowing through it. So let's take a look at the practical circuit. Here you can see that I have the AC mains, which is actually 240 volts in this case. It doesn't work very well at 120 volts. You need fairly high voltage to get this to work. And I have one side of it going to the same pin on the light bulb as the negative side of the DC power supply. It doesn't actually matter whether you use the negative or positive side of the ignited filament, as this is going to have roughly the same potential all the way across it. It'll only be different by about 12 volts. The other side, which is connected to the anode, which is the one that's not currently lit, is then routed to this 4.7k ohm power resistor, which we're measuring with the scope. Right now I have the lamp connected to about a 6.7 volt DC supply, and as you can see on the screen, no current is flowing. 
At this point, the light bulb is operating in a blocking mode in both directions of current. This is actually cool in and of itself because it means we can use this as a sort of switch. By increasing the filament temperature, we can actually turn the rectification on and off at will, sort of like a thyristor. But let's see what happens when we do turn up that filament voltage. Bearing in mind what we're doing is we're measuring the voltage across this 4.7k ohm resistor, which indicates the current flowing through it. So up the voltage goes, and as soon as we get above about 8 volts, suddenly we now have positive spikes, but no negative spikes. Current is able to flow through the resistor into the light bulb and back to the AC power source in one direction, but not in the other. We have indeed achieved a diode. If we continue to turn up the voltage, we'll see we get even better rectification with less voltage drop. So there it is. We actually are able to generate quite a sizable amount of uh, rectified current using just this simple light bulb technique. Let's go ahead and make one more modification to the circuit to make it a little bit more practical before we conclude this experiment. I've modified the rectifier circuit slightly by adding a 30 microfarad film capacitor across the load. I've also lowered the supply voltage from 240 volts down to about 130, which is the lowest voltage at which this system will operate and at which the rectifier will work. The reason I've lowered the voltage is because this bulb cannot withstand high reverse voltages that would be imposed by a DC bias on the capacitor. This would tend to cause breakdown and melting of the filament. But what's also interesting is because it's a hot cathode rectifier, applying more current to this over time results in its filament temperature rising. And when there's a capacitive load on it, it will actually oscillate over time, leading to unstable DC output voltage. By keeping the filament temperature low once we start it up though, we can still achieve a relatively constant DC voltage at the output. So let's try it out. I'm going to turn up the voltage gradually. And as you can see, we've just switched on rectification. Right now it's fairly stable. We're seeing a small amount of oscillation due to the uh, fluctuating AC ripple from the actual rectifier. However, one thing to note is if I continue to heat the filament, now we get much more unstable low frequency oscillation. As you can see, we get these pulses at much less than 60 hertz of very high voltage as the uh, rectifier effectively goes into momentary breakdown due to the presence of a DC bias and a much heavier load on the output. The capacitor basically acts like a constant voltage uh, sink, and that causes very large bursts of current to flow momentarily, which can damage the bulb if allowed to persist for too long. So to prevent bulb damage, I'm going to continue turning down the voltage here, and I'm going to go back to a stable level. I find that once the bulb has been ignited and operating, it runs best at about 9 volts, producing an output voltage rectified of about 50 volts from a 130 volt AC source. I think this is a really cool demonstration in general, not only with the capacitor, but also simply with the resistor showing that half-wave rectification. It's a simple demonstration of thermionic emission that can be constructed in any basic physics laboratory using appropriate safety precautions. This project is one that I built a few years ago out of some very old pre-1960s components. This power transformer, which steps 120 volts AC down to 6.3 volts AC, is from a 1930s era vacuum tube radio and originally powered the filaments within those vacuum tubes. Current from this transformer is then passed through a voltage doubling rectifier. I've constructed this rectifier using a selenium rectifier. Although this selenium rectifier contains four diodes, I'm only using two of those diodes to perform this rectification process. I have two 500 microfarad Cornell Dublier capacitors from the mid-1960s. One of them is leaking slightly, as you can see here, but it is still working suitably. The way this works is when positive uh, voltage is applied to this side relative to the output of the transformer on the, on the other terminal, current is allowed to flow into this capacitor, thus charging it to a positive DC voltage. Current returns through this uh, center tap between the two uh, capacitors to the transformer. The lower capacitor is charged when the AC waveform goes negative and then charges via this negatively polarized diode and then charges this to the same voltage as the top one uh, but negative relative to the center tap. The sum of these two capacitors is twice the peak voltage coming out of the transformer or about 17.8 volts DC when no load is applied. That 17 volt DC source can then be used to operate things like 12 volt to 5 volt DC to DC converters which are modern switch mode devices. In this particular case, this DC to DC converter can be plugged in and a power meter can be attached as well to indicate the voltage and the current being passed. A modern cell phone is being charged in this case 
and it's drawing about 0.84 amps from the power supply. The power supply provides a maximum of about 5 watts at the output, so it's probably not very efficient and certainly not very practical, but it's a fun demonstration of seeing very old uh, mid-century technology being used to power modern day devices. I found this battery sitting outside in the dirt, and it seems to be an alkaline type EverReady brand uh, AA cell, and I've actually had pretty good success trying to recharge alkaline batteries that have been run down. They never hold the same capacity that they would start with, but they can be recharged without exploding or causing any other damage if done properly. I've never tried to recharge one that's this far gone though, as it's obviously been outside for a long time and is highly corroded. So I'm going to start off first by cleaning it up, and we'll come back and measure it to see if there's any voltage at the terminals. So I cleaned up the battery and took a grinder to the ends to try to expose bare metal, but there wasn't much bare metal to be had. Both ends are just full of holes. What I can do though is take the multimeter and try to measure the voltage across this. So let's see what the DC voltage reads. Well, it doesn't seem to be shorted. It's reading anywhere between 40 and 100 millivolts, which I think is enough that the meter isn't showing a, a dead short. For example, if I short these together, it'll read hard zero. So there might be something to this that uh, we could potentially salvage for this experiment. And in fact, there it's actually gone quite stable to about 48 millivolts. So we'll go ahead and wire this up to the power supply and see if we can adjust uh, the current flow through it and see if we can get something to happen. So I managed to solder some wires onto what was left of the terminals of this battery. And um, we can just confirm that we still have DC voltage present at the output. And it looks like 33 millivolts and rising slowly because I think I did just short those out slightly. Uh, so this does tell me that I think the wires are making good contact with the battery terminals. So I've got my bench power supply set up here. Now the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the voltage to about uh, 1.7 volts for this alkaline cell. I want it slightly higher than the uh, nominal 1.5 volts to continue current flow through it, uh, but I don't want it so high that it just destroys the battery from over voltage. So I'll put it at about 1.7 volts, and I'm going to start out turning the current all the way down. So this is basically going to uh, drop the voltage to zero. That way we don't have any large inrush into the battery. Now these batteries are of course polarized, so I'm going to connect the positive terminal to the positive voltage source here, and I'm going to connect the negative terminal to the negative voltage source. And the trick to recharging any alkaline battery is going very slow. So for a normal alkaline battery AA, I would probably try to charge this at maybe one or 200 milliamps. Since this one's really badly damaged and I want my best chances of success with you know getting this to show any kind of voltage, I'm gonna just nudge the current up very slowly. So I wanna go to about 50 milliamps. So see it's just bounced up to half an amp because I don't have much precision on this but I'm gonna just go very slow here. I'm even gonna back it off lower than that. And I wanna leave it at about 50 milliamps, maybe even a little lower. That's about right. 60 is fine too. This is a really good sign. I'm showing 0.8 volts. That means that there is actually some resistance in this battery. It's not a dead short and it's not an open circuit. That's extremely good because it means that it's probably going to take some of this charge. No telling if it's gonna give it back out. It might just turn it into heat or evolve gas, but it's gonna do something. So this will be fun. So what I'm gonna do is leave this for a few hours, just do its thing, and I'll go ahead and film the other parts of the video. Even after waiting more than an hour, the voltage has not risen beyond 0.7 volts at 60 milliamps. I suspect a large amount of shunt resistance is present in this battery. What I'm going to do then is increase the current substantially so that we can try to raise that voltage level. We'll try charging with 200 milliamps, which is fairly aggressive, but we'll see if this uh, is able to eventually overcome that internal series resistance. I'll come back after this is run for a bit longer. This project went on a little bit longer than expected. I ended up leaving the battery connected to the power supply for on the order of 24 hours and saw relatively little change in its behavior. What ended up happening was the battery would actually charge basically linearly proportional to its voltage, so it obviously had a very high shunt resistance where it would self-discharge. Um, but what was interesting was it did have a stable voltage at which it would remain for prolonged periods of time. That voltage was not 1.5 volts though, it was about 0.2 volts. It could stay at 0.2 volts and it could actually even provide a small amount of current at 0.2 volts, but it was just such a small amount of voltage that you couldn't really do much with it initially. But then I had a couple of interesting thoughts. 
So let me show you what this does when connected to some various types of loads that you wouldn't normally be able to drive with a 1.5 volt battery, let alone a 200 millivolt source. So I've just gone ahead and connected the battery to a very aggressive, effectively unlimited current source here. And it's drawing about 0.9 amps, which would normally be way too much for charging any sort of an alkaline battery. But at this point, I want to just see what its behavior is under fairly high fast charge rate conditions. What I want to show you though is how the voltage rapidly deteriorates, but doesn't go all the way to zero. So it's been running for just a few minutes here. I'm going to disconnect it from the power supply now. And we can measure its voltage. So if you bring this into the frame and measure, right now it's reading about 0.85 volts, but it's falling off quickly. What we'll see though is that it will eventually equilibrate somewhere between 100 and 200 millivolts. Even though a couple hundred millivolts is not enough to operate any sort of semiconductor device, at least not by itself, I can connect a small speaker momentarily and you can just about hear the sounds that it makes. It's very quiet, but there is some sound coming from it. I've connected an LED across a coil of wire that acts as an inductor. Normally it takes close to three volts to drive an LED, but because we have an inductor here, any amount of current that this battery can provide can be passed through this inductor and simply by removing the wire from the inductor, spikes of voltage can be produced by the law of induction that can drive the LED and cause small pulses of light. Let's demonstrate it. This battery has been off the charger for quite some time, but as you can see we can still generate small intermittent bursts of light from the LED. Now if I wanted to get super fancy, I could probably design some kind of oscillator circuit that would rectify this power and then use it to drive a transistor to continuously obtain a supply of uh, power from the battery. It would eventually run down, of course, but it would extend the amount of light you could produce. Now this has been kind of an academic exercise because obviously there's really no practical use for a battery in this condition, but it's really been interesting because it's introduced me to quite a few concepts in ultra low power energy harvesting. I've thought of quite a few circuits that could potentially be used to convert very low voltages in the hundreds of millivolts range up into usable voltages that could power microcontrollers, field sensors, or other small devices. Additionally, it's introduced me to some of the concepts in recharging alkaline batteries, and additionally, into using materials that normally wouldn't operate as batteries as methods for short-term energy storage. I might do a video on that in the future, but for now, I would say this was already a success in that we were able to produce some LED light from this uh, battery, even in the condition that it's in right now. I hope you enjoyed this short video segment format for this video. I might do more quick videos like this in the future. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.